The Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Senior Chanticleer Columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. With me today, as always, is my Chanticleer colleague, the man who's always pushing for a spot on the podium, it's Anthony McDonald. How are you, Anthony? Faster, higher, stronger this week, James. Love and life. Fantastic. This week, we unpick a massive week on global markets, including Australia's inflation surprise. We examine the trouble with bubbles in China, and we ask why regional airline Rex fell from the sky. But first, Anthony, let's head to a place we don't usually go on the Chanticleer podcast, and that's into the nation's car yards. As you wrote this week, uh, all's not exactly well with the car dealers of Australia. What's going on here, mate? Well, James, the car yards are full. The dealers can't sell them. Prices are coming down. Margins are getting crushed. And the dealers are worried that all this is going to get worse before it gets better. And James, like a lot of things, it's because of COVID. It's because of what's happened since COVID. It's because of the industry trying to find its new normal. So remember there was all those car shortages in COVID? The supply yep. chains were cactus. You know, car yards were empty. Prices skyrocketed. If you wanted to buy a Toyota RAV4, you had to wait six years to get one, all, all that sort of stuff. And then we had like the catch-up era where it was great for dealers because you had all these people that wanted cars still. The cars were flowing out of the factories. The dealers were pumping through good volumes, good prices. There was still that stimulus money sort of slushing around the economy. The dealers got a fair bit of that. But now that catch-up buying is all done, all that stimulus has caused inflation. So interest rates have been jacked up to get on top of the inflation. Yep. That's made yep. it, that's put pressure on consumers. It's slowed down the economy. It's made it harder for people to buy cars. And the poor old car dealers are sitting there with supply chains that are working brilliantly, got no <laughs> trouble getting cars, but they just can't sell them at the prices they want to. And I presume this is whacking their margins first and foremost. Exactly. So it's, it's hit their margins. So if you look at the two listed car dealer groups or the two big ones in Australia, Eagers yep. and Peter Warren, sh- shares in those are down 20 to 30% this year. So, I mean, investors are aware of this story, but for us, I mean, it's not something we normally look at, but it's actually quite interesting and it affects a lot of us. And, you know, it probably sounds like it could be a good time to buy a car, James. I mean, are you in the market? Uh, a little bit, yes. I, I, I've got a an old secondhand car that my uh, <laughs> my my family believes needs to be replaced. Um, uh, I don't actually mind driving a bomb around. It's it's nice not to worry about it. But I, I get their point that you you do want to be safe. So maybe I should uh, wander out there and see what I can, what sort of trade in I can get. Mate, you might get a Beamer. No, I think I'd have to pay someone to take this car off my hands. <laughs> but um. Anthony, this is a really good example, as you said, of how the COVID pull forward in demand. Mm. Eventually, we catch up to that. Yeah. But also, you think about the other things going on in the car market. We've got electric vehicle penetration sort of, it shot up and now it's fallen away a little bit. We're maybe not that far away, maybe, from driverless cars. Like, it's a bit of a precarious place to be a car dealer, isn't it? There's a lot going on. There's plenty going on. And, uh, and, you know, we're still waiting for Tesla to see if they've got these driverless cars and robo-taxis going or not, James. We'll find out more about that in uh, October. Right. Well, if you're in the car yard uh, this weekend, make sure you drive a very hard bargain. They've, uh, the, the deal has got room to move. Anthony, it's really tough to run an airline in this country. Mm. We saw budget airline Bonza collapse earlier this year. It's now gone. And this week, Regional Express, which is better known in the market as Rex, uh, flies a lot of regional routes, but also had a crack at flying between Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney, what's known as the Golden Triangle. They also went into administration this week. Is this about competition in the market? Is this about travel and uh, consumer sentiment weakening? What's the story behind the story here? I reckon it's more of the former rather than latter. I think it's more about the competition in the market and how strong those big incumbents are. So it's a shocking time to be the country's third, fourth, fifth biggest airline. And and in reality, it sort of always has been. Yeah. Because you've got this huge dominant player, Qantas, with about 65% of the market. You've got a number two player, Virgin, which while it cut, while it went broke in the pandemic, it's now back on a more stable footing with about 30% of the market and it sort of leaves five to ten percent for other players and 
And that 5 to 10%, it's just not big enough because to run an airline, you actually need quite a big footprint. You need slots in the airport. You need actual planes to put in the sky. They're not cheap. You need staff. You need the customer proposition, the sales, all that stuff. Yeah. You need scale. You need scale. And when you've got two players with 90 to 95% of the market between them, doesn't leave much scale for everyone else and and no one's been able to crack it. And unfortunately, James, the thing that brought Rex undone is that it tried to crack it. Yes. On the mainstream routes, right? It tried to make that Melbourne to Sydney, the, the route that we hear about that's so lucrative for the airlines. It tried to make it work there and it just hasn't. So it feels like we're the furthest away from more competition than we have been ever, doesn't it? Yeah. I think one of the great ironies here, Anthony, is is this – all this goes back to the collapse of another airline. That's Virgin. Yeah. Remember, Virgin collapsed at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. Rex decided, hey, we will buy some of the Virgin planes and have a crack flying the Golden Triangle, Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney. Now, what they should have done is said, right, Virgin's collapse shows how hard those routes are. We're going to stick with our regional routes that are actually profitable, really important service in those areas that's our bread and butter. Let's stick with that. But instead, they borrowed $150 million, and instead of putting it into their regional fleet, they went and, and tried to take on Qantas and Jetstar, and then Virgin's come back. It's just a mess. Um, the, the, the thing here that's interesting, Anthony, talking to some of the people inside the industry, Qantas, Virgin, they don't want Rex to fall over mm. because they need Rex flying those regional routes. Because, you know, if you're in Port Headland and that brings a traveler to Perth, that's a, a, a sort of classic Rex, Rex route, that's good because, you know, then that traveler can jump on a Jetstar or a Qantas or a Virgin plane and get to the next destination. So the other airlines and the entire tourism industry benefits from. Rex's network. And so that leaves the federal government in a sticky situation. Yes, Rex has gone down, but does the government need to chip in some money in some form to get it started again and, and keep the voters in regional seats happy? Please no, because those things normally don't end up end up going well, do they? But James, it's also like Bonza. When Bonza went down as well, then we heard all these stories about, oh, actually, I used to use Bonza and I flew from Sunshine <laughs> Coast to Townsville and it, it was yes. great. Yeah. Like, so customers like these Challenger airlines. Problem is they like them because the planes are only a third full. And the fares are cheap. Yeah. 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 No, you're exactly right. I, I, let's see where this one goes. There's a lot of talk that, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this. There's there, there's even talk that the government might take an equity stake in Rex to keep it going. I can't quite believe that, but it ha apparently it hasn't been ruled out. As you say, it'd be something from... 40 years ago. Let's see where it goes. I mean, they had their chance in the pandemic. They could have bought a stake in any airline they wanted and opted yeah. not to. Yet, what, four years later, we might might be there. Anyway, interesting yeah. times. And just quickly, James, we said last week it was a big week for tech earnings in the US. We've had Microsoft, Meta Platforms, and then on Friday morning, we've heard from Amazon, Apple, and our very own Atlassian. It's all about AI right now, but sum up, what have we learned here? Well, Anthony, I think we've learned lots and lots, but we've also learned nothing. I mean, we've learned that the investment in AI is huge. Microsoft's capital expenditure is running at sort of an annualized rate of $123 billion, that's Australian dollars, and Amazon's uh, CapEx is running at about $92 billion. So that, that is a huge amount of money. Mm. But I, I still don't think we've learned a whole lot about how that investment is going to be monetized or how it's going to turn into profit. Now, Microsoft says demand's high and it says that's coming through in the growth of their cloud business and Amazon says broadly the same thing. But I'm not sure that investors are completely convinced about that yet. Um, and then you've got this other concern and that's the possibility that the US economy might be slowing, perhaps even heading for a recession. Yeah. Um, now that's bad for tech companies broadly, but it also raises an, a question around AI. And that's will big corporates keep experimenting with AI if we do hit a recession? Mm. I, I, so I think this is all going to be fascinating to watch. I think that the, the big tech companies are still very highly valued, but the skepticism is still building in the market. Yeah, that AI debate will rage, James, for a long time yet. Absolutely. 
Well, Anthony, let's move to our first topic, and it's alive. My long-held prediction that the RBA will cut interest rates in February 2025 is once again alive and kicking (laughs) after fears of a hot set of inflation numbers on Wednesday proved to be unfounded. Now, yes, headline inflation increased from 36 to 3.8% in the June quarter, but that is bang in line with what the RBA has been forecasting. And trimmed mean inflation, which is an important measure that excludes energy and fresh food, fell from 4% to 3.9%. Anthony, there was a remarkable turnaround on Wednesday from where money markets thought interest rates might go next. On Tuesday, they were giving a 20% chance for the RBA hiking rates next month. Mm. And now they're giving an 80% chance to a rate cut before the end of the year. And a rate cut is fully priced in for February. Wow. (laughs) Anthony, this is sweet relief for the RBA Governor Michelle Bullock, isn't it? And sweet relief for me, whose uh, interest rate prediction was looking poor. The RBA doesn't want to raise rates. And now Bullock has got breathing room. Sure is sweet relief, James. And it's another reminder for all of our listeners that all this noise that market in markets, all this junk that trading desks pump out and everything, they're just talking their own book, right? They're just trying to create volatility to, you know, buy bonds, sell bonds, whatever, just to get the money flowing around so they can all make money. You just sit here and listen to the one punter that's got nothing to sell but newspaper columns and the best contact <laughs> book in town. <laughs> so you think, James? Oh, I, I, I was I was uh, prevaricating last week. To be fair, Anthony, I, <laughs> I, I thought I could see a hike too. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. There, there, there's a lot of talk, but w- what's it all come to in the end? Don't worry, it wasn't just you, James. So I saw one of the big bank CEOs this week before the CPI decision, and he was forecasting potentially two back to back rate rises later this year. Right? That's before before the yeah, CPI wow. came out. Now, no one would be talking about that. So. Yeah, I mean it's it's been going it's been going around. But yeah, like you said, James, you said that CPI numbers come out and showed inflation of about one percent for the quarter. It was basically in line with RBA expectations and it's got us on track for that soft landing, you know, the inflation back to the middle of the two to three percent range in twenty twenty six while also maintaining the strong employment. So yeah, we're back on track. The um it's funny, isn't it, how the interest rate markets just turn around, rate cuts are back on the cards, equity markets rallying even more than it was soft landings back on track baby so yeah it's um yeah, yeah it's, it's just fascinating how it goes and james this was just one data point this week we had big rates news from the bank of japan and the federal reserve as well sum those ones up for us well the bank of japan did something incredible they haven't done it since 2017 they actually raised rates wow uh they went from zero <laughs> To zero point two five percent, so no one's getting too antsy there. But but there, it, it was a a big move in the context of uh, how the Bank of Japan has tried to hold the yen down and tried to hold their rates down and actually encourage inflation, which has been missing in Japan for a long time. Now they've got a bit of inflation and they've moved there. The Federal Reserve, well, on Thursday morning our time, they came out and held rates steady at between 5.25 and 5.5%, as expected. But Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve Chairman, he said a rate cut is on the table for September. Mm -hmm. All the market heard was rate cut in September, (laughs) and away they went. Markets rallied, and everyone's happy. Now, one thing here, Anthony, how much has actually changed? I look at the Fed, the Bank of Japan, and the RBA. Hey, Guess what? Inflation came in exactly where it was supposed to. Yeah. It's still uncomfortably high in yeah. Australia. It's still out of the target band in the US. Nothing much has changed here. So no one should get overly excited. And and yes, there is a natural tendency to get excited about rate cuts. But what do rate cuts mean? Rate cuts mean that the economy is slowing. Rate cuts and a slowing economy usually means earnings are going down. That's not a happy story. But It's all about what your expectations, isn't it? Everyone from Jim Chalmers to the to the banks were softening us up for a rate hike. We didn't get it, so we all feel good. And Mm. hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Anthony, an interesting point is that all this has happened right on the eve of earnings season, which is a very volatile time for the local market anyway. Do you reckon the fact that a rate hike is seemingly off the table in Australia, does that change much about what investors need to consider? I think it does, James. And now I agree with you for all the reasons you just mentioned that, you know, there's nothing's really changed, but 
I've been thinking about a lot this week and putting together a bit of a list of things to look out for this reporting season. And, and it's all going to be about the next 12 months profits and then the 12 months after that. Yep. So we already know that the year to June 30 was hard for a lot of companies compared to the year prior. You know, earnings across the market are going to be down, say, 5% compared to the year before. Expectations are that earnings next year, so in the 2025 financial year, um, are going to be up about 5%. So investors are just going to be looking for information that fills in how they can get to that 5% earnings uplift. Yep. Otherwise, they're going to be cutting their forecasts, and that's when the companies will be under pressure. So most of the attention will be on the forecasts. But this week's inflation number, the impact on rates, I think it does help there, right? Anything that's consumer-facing is going to be helped by the rates being stable and then potentially cut. Likewise, I mean, your banks, utilities, whose customers are under pressure, the miners, I mean, just, just generally with the miners, cutting rates is normally good for stimulating economic growth, but that's more of a global story. They're probably more pushed around by what um, Powell's saying rather than Michelle Bullock. But I think it does. I think, um, you know, investors will go into this reporting season now, probably not fearful about what their company's outlook looks like at slightly higher interest rates and more confident about what their outlook will look like with slightly lower rates. So I think I think there will be a bit of a difference, James. Um, no, I'm not so sure, Anthony. Yeah? I, I, I think I, I'm wary of this idea that we get very caught up and, hey, I do it too. The, our paper does it. We get very caught up in trying to figure out when exactly when the next rate move is, right? When you look back in five or 10 years at your investment portfolio, the precise timing, is it November, is it February, doesn't matter. It's the direction of travel that matters. And to me, I, I take your point that that, that fear of uh, higher rates might have been taken off the table. But to me, it's all about what's the has the environment changed? Are consumers suddenly going to be under less pressure? No, because interest rates aren't, aren't moving and consumers' savings buffers are being run down and they'll continue to be run down. So the consumer's not in a great place. Is the geopolitical situation changing? You know, if you're exposed to China, is China going to improve? If you're exposed to the US, what are you going to expect there? So I just think there's a risk that investors get too caught up in the macro and forget about the micro. There's going to be some companies going into this reporting season who have very different margin outlooks. Some will be able to pass through higher prices. Some will have lost that pricing power. Those are the sort of things that I'd be focused on. I'm not entirely sure how important the macro settings are. But look, it's another input and it's one of many. You know, We'll be looking to see, Anthony, what, what impact does the, have the stage three tax cuts had for mm. people? That that might be equivalent to a rate cut for some consumer facing businesses. So there's a lot to play for, a lot to look at. It's going to be a fascinating earnings season. All right, Anthony, you know what my rates prediction is. I'm I'm sticking very uh, fast to my February twenty five cut. What what are you thinking? Uh, were you swayed by that bank boss who said two hikes, or do you think they're out of the money now? I told him he was dreaming. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about that. I think I've said this a few times on the podcast, James, but when the Reserve Bank decides to sit for a while, it sits for a while, like 18 months. So I don't, I don't reckon we're going anywhere. I mean, we've been through these stats before on the pod, but we've been at 4.35% for nine months now. Before that, we spent 18 months at 0.1%. We spent nearly three years at 1.5% from 2016 to 2019. Wow. Before that, we did a year at 2%, and we did nearly 18 months at 2.5% before that. So when we find a level that the RBA thinks is just the right sort of mix between demand and supply in the economy, jobs and growth, all that stuff, we tend to sit for a while. And I reckon we might have found that spot. So I, th I think we're sitting here for, it could be this time next year and we're still the same. Wow. Okay. Well, that's a, that, that's a bold prediction. Uh, I'm sticking with February 2025. There's a lot of people saying we go before the end of the year, so maybe there's a Christmas present in the stocking for uh, Australian households. Okay, James, let's move to our second topic of the week. And while the world was transfixed by interest rates, the Olympics and geopolitics, a funny thing was happening in China. We know that the property bubble in China burst a few years ago, and the investment bubble has basically deflated as well. The Chinese stock market has become uninvestable in the eyes of many investors, but this week you warned of a new bubble. What is it, James, and what does it mean? 
Well, there's a bubble in the bond market in China. Mm. Um, bond yields have fallen to record lows. Uh, and that means, because bond prices move in the opposite direction to yields, bond prices have hit record highs. There is money pouring into the Chinese bond market. So why is it pouring into the Chinese bond market? Because Chinese investors want nothing to do with the property market, which is, uh, in your, to use your word, cactus. <laughs> they want nothing to do with the share market because things are really volatile there. And they're pumping all their money into the supposed safe haven of bonds. Now, you might say, well, that's good. The Chinese economy is weak. That means there's more money to slosh around and perhaps some of that money will get lent. But that's not what the Chinese government thinks. They have been warning. They've d- delivered about 11 warnings in the since April that there is a bubble here and investors need to be careful. The thing they're most worried about is their their banks. So their banks have got excess cash because no one's really borrowing in, in the business community or from households. And what are the banks doing with that excess cash? They're pumping it into bonds. Now, the danger here is that it's all well and good while uh, bond yields are falling. But if bond yields start rising and the economy starts to turn around, there is a danger that these banks are going to be caught with a mismatch. They're not going to get rid of these bonds quickly enough. uh, And we're going to see what happened, the sort of thing that happened with Silicon Valley Bank, where there's an interest rate mismatch Uh, that comes and bites these banks in the bum. So to me, what's interesting about it is the fact that all these things are happening at the same time. It used to be that 15 years ago, if you'd said the Chinese property market's going to be kaput, the Chinese stock market's going to be sort of uninvestable, and there's going to be a bubble in the Chinese bond market, the federal government would be panicking. People would be selling BHP and Rio in the streets. But everyone seems pretty relaxed about it. Maybe that's because there's so much else to worry about, you know, that where the yen's going and what the Fed's doing and, you know, the Middle East and Ukraine and, you know, there's a million things you can turn your mind to. But I just wonder if we're sort of missing the main story here. This is really important, I think. Think about what might happen to China within the next six months. If Trump wins uh, the White House in November, They could be hit with massive tariffs, which are another blow to the Chinese economy. So I just reckon this is a story that's being underplayed a little. Yeah, good point, James. You're right. Like, no one really talks about iron ore at 50 bucks a tonne, do they? But um, No. Yeah, it's at twice that at the moment. But that's that's happened a couple of times in the past 10 years. So it's it's not out of the realms of possibility. Now, James, obviously Australia has a lot riding on this. And we had Rio Tinto's June half earnings come out this week. They're sort of right at the front of the earnings season. Did it sound like they were starting to get worried? Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, you mentioned iron ore at fifty bucks. It sounds crazy, but hey, the iron ore price has come down from one hundred and forty US dollars a ton at the start of the year to about a hundred. Mm. That's a fair drop in in the space of eight months. But Jakob Stalsholm, the CEO of Rio, he's pretty sanguine. You know, he concedes that there's a problem in the property market. There's a hundred million less tons of steel going into Chinese property than there was three years ago. But he reckons, well, about forty million tons of that has been picked up from green industries, and manufacturing is going okay, and infrastructure is going okay. And hey, the economic growth rate in China is still five percent. Might be a bit made up, but it's still five percent. So they seem pretty pretty sanguine about the whole thing, which is a bit surprising to me. I wonder if they're a bit more worried behind the scenes. Look, the iron ore miners, their costs are, are, are way down, you know, towards $20 a tonne. So yeah. they, they've got plenty of margin to keep them fat and happy. But yeah, it's an interesting picture. I mean, one of the consequences of the weakness in China is seen in commodity prices. And we just mentioned iron ore, but there's also oil and copper. Now, we've heard a lot about copper, we've talked a lot about in the podcast, about copper demand from the energy transition and the AI boom. But does this China weakness hurt that demand or are those stories still intact, do you think? I think that copper story is definitely intact. James, and have you noticed, it just it just feels like all the attention around our big miners, BHP and Rio Tinto, has flipped to copper. It feels like just in the past month or so, yeah. it's like the pennies finally dropped. And if you look at Rio's results On Wednesday, there was a lot of focus on copper. I'd say there was much more focus on that than iron ore, even though iron ore is the earnings engine. They went on the analyst call. The first question was from Goldman's Paul Young. 
And the question was, talk us through your copper ramp up story. Yeah. You know, that's what the analysts are focused on. They're, they're more worried about copper, the tons coming through in copper than they are on the Pilbara, even though Rio makes bucket loads more money selling iron ore out of the Pilbara than it does in copper. So they, they're not worried about the Pilbara's, you know, price, cost, volume, relations with traditional owners. They're, they're focused on the copper ramp up. So I think- Yeah. I think the market's really just waken up to that story about copper and how strong it is. I mean, in the same week, James, we had BHP bid US $3 billion for a copper development. Not a mine, not even close no. to it. This thing's not going to be a mine for 10 years or more, right? In Argentina, just a 50% stake alongside the Lundin family. It's a huge, huge bet for an undeveloped project, like the biggest one we've seen of these in years. And Why? It's because it's thinking about 2030, 2040, 2050. Mate, yep. this, this time next century, if it works, they might be mining that site. You know, and, <laughs> But it's not without risk. It's, it's at very high altitude. It's in tough mining conditions. There's going to be huge issues they'll have to overcome to get there. But it just shows you how strong that copper story is, yeah. James. And I mean, at the same time, we've got these rumors flying around about big miners looking at tech resources from over, over in Canada. A big metals company. I mean, Bloomberg ran a report as nearly a week ago, I think, that named half a dozen potential yes. suitors for what would be a you know tens of billion dollar deal, and all the big miners were said to be having a look now, including Rio, which uh, Anthony, yeah, uh, and, and just on that, I mean. Jakob Stolzheim told me that he he's not going to blow Rio up chasing some big deal just to sort of keep up with the Joneses, but he did agree that there's a bit of deal fever in the mining sector. That worries me. W will this all end badly? 100% there's deal fever <laughs> and 100% it's going to end badly. <laughs> I say, James, like, you know what? Like all those, all those companies reportedly kicking tires on tech resources and each other, you know, it's probably true. All of these yeah. companies have watch lists that they keep an eye on. It doesn't mean that they're about to launch a bid. It doesn't mean that tech's about to get taken over, but it can mean they're interested. And it just feels like the tectonic plates are shifting in copper in particular, right? Look at the big resources companies. There's been a lot of big deals in the past year or two. You know, like Newmont bought Newcrest, Glencore bought the tech still making coal business, BHP tried to get Anglo-American. In Australia, we had that, had that lithium tie-up, uh, which created what's now Arcadian. Like there's a lot of action going on. These things are always a cycle. The scramble's on, the plates are shifting. The focus is shifting from coal and iron ore from the bulks to things like copper yep. and James, I know Jakob at Rio Tinto and Mike Henry at BHP promise it won't end in tears. I know they both talk about their commitments, capital disciplined, and how good their companies have been for a long time now, which is, you know, four or five years. You only have to go back a decade and, you know, they both dusted lots of cash on acquisitions. So <laughs> Billions. Unfortunately, it feels like we're headed there, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Just getting back to China, though, is the last one. Does Jim Chalmers, the treasurer, start to get worried about China? I mean, I mean, to be fair, the RBA, Michelle Bullock, it has been in her statements pretty regularly that they're watching the Chinese property market closely. Yeah, I think so, James. But uh, Jim Chalmers has to be worried about China, right? Because our number one export is iron ore. It's, yep. it's, got to be, it's one of the biggest ticket items in the budget. So we need, we need it for our tax revenue. So, you know, please God for Australia that that iron ore price <laughs> stays up where it is. Yeah. All right, Anthony, we'll come back after the break with a really interesting question about bank mergers and bank technology. We'll be back in a sec. Welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Saturday morning, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them straight to your inbox. Okay, Anthony. Uh, well, the RBA rates decision on Tuesday, probably going to be a nil all draw, no change. Yep. Um, but we'll we'll watch what Michelle Bullock has to say about where we're going next, I guess. Absolutely. But James, we've still got Michelle Bullock's press conference to try and work out where it's all headed. We do get a couple more results, as we said. We're getting into earnings season. Next week, we've got Coronado Coal, AMP, Mervac, and Transurban. Anything to watch there, Anthony? I think Mervac's pretty interesting, James. I mean, the, there's no bigger story in Australia than the housing market and 
development, construction, particularly in the wake of all this CFMEU stuff. So it'd be interesting to say what, what they say about the outlook for the sector. Yes. And uh, one thing I'm looking forward to, uh, 4.25 on August 11 oh, yeah. is is the uh, athletics, the 15... 15- the 100 metres women's final. Now, Jessica Hull as, uh, is the world record holder. Anthony, have you been loving the Olympics? It's it's just great fun to watch, isn't it? It is, James. I mean, I thought I grew out of the Olympics, but this one's <laughs> definitely sucked me back in. I don't know if this, it's the time zone or what, but yeah, it's been brilliant. Yeah, and I've uh, loved becoming an instant expert in archery and uh, skateboarding and BMX riding and oh, any sport I can... I can tell you all about it after three minutes of watching on the couch. So. How good Simone Biles? Oh, <laughs> amazing, amazing. All right, we love questions here at the Chanticleer Podcast. Uh, this week, our question's from Bruce from Brisbane. If you've got a question you want to send in, you can email us at chanticleer at afr.com, and you can also send us a question in audio form. Just record a voice memo on your phone, include your name and where you're from, and email it to us, which is exactly what Bruce has done. Hello, Chooks. The CBA has an enormous resource backing to combat cybercrime. But what about the small banks? For example, RSCQ Bank with its tiny $8.237 million result for last year, how do the small banks manage the cybercrime issue? Is there some pooling of resources through perhaps the Australian Banking Association? Otherwise, how can they manage to defend themselves and their members against cybercrime? I know that deposits with banks are guaranteed by the federal government to $250,000, but I also wonder if getting that money back per the government processes might take such a long, long time, notwithstanding that you would eventually receive compensation for any bank failure. How do these small banks do it? Well, Anthony, this is a really interesting question from Bruce, particularly this week, because after 743 days, uh, ANZ was finally able to buy Suncorp's bank uh, this week, complete the deal. And this issue was one that was raised by both Suncorp and ANZ. And that is that Suncorp's ability to combat cybercrime and keep up with all the other technology changes was just so limited because Mm. it was a small bank. And I think Bruce is right, isn't he? The the pressures on small banks to keep up in this area is just enormous. Yeah, it's it's just the size of the war chest, isn't it, James? It's like we were talking about last week with the AI spend. I mean, do you remember that number? I think we threw out there. There's a handful of those big companies in the US spending US $360 billion this year on yeah. CapEx and R&D. Yeah. I mean, the Australian banking is a similar sort of story. You've got, you've got four big banks with the war chess and the ability to invest in technology at the same time that the battle has shifted from branches to online and the weapons in the online battle. I mean, that's, that's all your online products. It's, and it's things like cyber as well, as well, that you need to prepare for the, for the risks of the future. So, I mean, to Bruce's question, I think it's very hard for the small banks. I mean, Bendigo uh, and Adelaide bank has shown us that you can't, that can be done. I mean, they can develop where they can. And they've actually, a couple of the analysts have pointed out that Bendigo has actually done a better job at, at developing some of its online presence than some of the big banks have. But mm. so Bendigo I develops sometimes, it partners up with, with others when it makes sense to as well, including CBA. But at the end of the day, I think it's really pushing it uphill on that yeah. battle. And the, the big banks with the big war chests, as long as they spend it correctly, they should be better placed. Yeah, there could be some changes in this area too. I mean, there's a lot of people pushing for a system where the banks refund the victims of cybercrime. Mm-hmm. Again, like the big banks would be better placed to do that than the small banks, uh, particularly when the uh, w- when the cyber attacks are large. So does a system like that come in? Look, there's a lot of consumer advocates pushing for it. It has come in in Britain. Um, the banks are very resistant, as you'd imagine here. But I think this is an ongoing issue because – you, you know, you talk to the bank CEOs as much as me. This is the big pain in their bums, really. It's something that is getting worse and worse and worse every day. They get no credit for fixing it or even mitigating it. No one wants to talk about it, but they've just got to dedicate so much time and resources to it. So, Bruce, great point. It's a issue we need to watch. 
All right, Anthony, we'll let you get back to the couch for a big weekend of Olympics watching. And next week, I'll join you with a very special guest. Michael Stutchbury finishes up at the AFR, a magnificent 13-year stint as Editor-in-Chief. We're going to have him on the podcast, Anthony, to get some of his final thoughts. That'll be a great episode, James. I look forward to it. Fantastic. See you then, Anthony. If you like the podcast and you want to hear more, consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. For more, go to AFR.com and you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at AFR.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson and Anthony McDonald, and it was produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.